It's just an honor to have you with us today. I want to also thank my partners, Amy and your, and I, th I think Devin's back here, and I know um, just amazing partnership. Craig, are you still here? There's Craig Rice. Thank you. It was just beautiful. This lodgy this day. It's been a wonderful partnership. You just gave a beautiful introduction of the Choice Cinema Series in the footsteps of Gordon Parks. But we have, I have a beautiful surprise for you um, today. And before I get to, we have an additional special guest with my brother, my, I call him my cousin, Kyle Johnson, um, is here with us. And um, having Kyle with us has been a vision for years. I even shared with Uncle Gordon, that Uncle Gordon, I said, I've got to have Kyle here with us in the Twin Cities. He's got to come and be with us. But I have another special guest that I would love to introduce in a few minutes, but someone who is very precious. So... Brother Park Scholar, I'd like you to come up now. Um, yes, you know who you are, Scholar Cruz. Um, my greatest joy and blessing, only after being um, Stevie's, Stephen's wife, is to be to walk with J Jamie Tomlin, uh, stand up Jamie, my co-teacher at Gordon Parks High School, um, where we are so honored to co-teach the, the Parks Legacy class uh, with the most amazing scholars in the world. And um, a number of years ago, we've been teaching the class for seven years, and a number of years ago, we had an opportunity to take Park scholars to Fort Scott, Kansas where our scholars had an, were able to be in the place where Uncle Gore was born and laid to rest, and where he filmed the learning tree. And with Spark, Park scholars at the cemetery, see, one of them lift his hands to the sky and say, Mr. Parks, thank you for saving my life. Um, to have young people from St. Paul walk in his footsteps, um, so every day we get to pour into them, and I get to tell them, but there are days I'll need you more than you need me. And this young brother right here has touched my soul, soul. Please do not leave here without going and seeing the exhibit in the hallway. Many of these young people who have walked in his footsteps but live visions, have found their visions as visionaries like Uncle Gordon. But this young brother here, you've got to know him. You are looking at Gordon Parks. I'm so proud of him. And he is going to read you his vision. So I want you to proudly share who you are and then lift up your vision. Okay. You need me to hold it? You know by heart. You got it on. No. Oh, okay. okay. Hello, everyone. Sorry, I'm a little stage fright. <laughs> well, um, my name is Davian Duran Cruz. I attend Gordon Parks High School, and I actually just moved to Minnesota not too long ago, but since I've been here, I can say that the legacy class has really improved my way of thinking by a lot, especially when it comes to empathy, putting myself in other people's shoes. And um, it was an assignment to write a vision statement. And I was supposed to do a rough draft on it, but to be honest, it just kind of like, you know how it just flows? I didn't even have to. So after after I was finished, she was like, nope, you're good. This, that's it. That's it, right? So I'm like, all right, bet. And um, I just wanted to uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to come up here and present it yes. today. But I wanted to um, read it to you guys. So I kind of need you. Thank you. As a part scholar, my vision of peace means much more than the state of tranquility. Peace is the ability to obtain freedom. It's the feeling that possesses you while striving for comfort. Honestly, I believe we stand in our own way because most of us have yet to master the elements of peace. Why is that, you ask? It's due to the fact of, of us, it's due to the fact of us not knowing the elements of peace. I hope my vision statement reveals these to you in a way 
you all can comprehend. Calmness is the first element of peace in my mind that leads us into the path of stability. That stability teaches us how to be humble. It teaches us empathy, the feeling of being in someone else's situation that can be so different yet so similar. With this empathy being discovered, we also start to realize the power in silence, which is a major element in peace. What's understood has no need to be verbalized. Now, with this nonverbal but yet very powerful connection we have acquired through one another by studying the elements of peace, it teaches us the most important element of peace, the power of recognizing negative outcomes and immediately becoming exempt from the entire situation, the power of love you have for yourself and others around you to continue the study of peace, to maintain the state of tranquility, the state of humbleness, the state of stability, the state of silence, the state of freedom which we have fought for over 400 years to obtain, the state of undeniable, true, everlasting peace. Woo! Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. 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 He is here for so many reasons, but my life, I'm not even going to talk a whole lot because we have so many amazing visionaries who will be before you. I had a long journey with my uncle all of my life. He was my great uncle, but he was my mentor, and he was my very dear friend. And my last visit with Uncle Gordon in New York before he died, I had a whole day where I received instructions from him. And at the end of the day, with tears in his eyes, he asked me, baby, what's going to happen to black boys? What did I really do? I said, Uncle Gordon, I promise you, your vision will not be in vain. We've got this. I promise you. This is one of my co-promise keepers. It's one of my co-legacy keepers. I have a program called Choice of Weapons Fellowship for Young Black Men. It actually started before Uncle Gordon died. One of my choice fellows asked me once, Mr. Ms. Robin, if you're if, if you were to, your uncle were to, was alive, he asked you that today, what would you tell him? I say, Uncle Gordon, they're going to stand before an audience of people after a screening of the learning tree, and they're going to lift up their vision of peace. They're going to be just fine. In spite of us living in a state where the narrative is black men in death, where the world is watching, and that's the narrative, we're going to say no. That is not the only narrative of Minnesota. The narrative is black men as visionaries, lifting up visions of hope, healing, humanity, and peace. Thank you. Thank you. Now for our next surprise. My dear brother, Kevin Brown, said that this moment would be epic. Kevin played the role of Gordon Parks, and for me was an eight-year labor of love. The production of Parks, a portrait of a young artist, which just closed a little few weeks ago at the History Theater here in St. Paul. We talk about we still, we miss each other so, but he brilliantly portrayed Uncle Gordon, the young Gordon Parks. And along with my brother, Kyle Johnson, the two, only two men that played Uncle Gordon in the world <laughs> is here with us also this afternoon. And so I'm going to ask um, my dear brother Kyle and my dear brother Kevin to join me. I couldn't think of two better people to talk about walking in Uncle Gordon's footsteps than these two amazing men. If you would join us. Come on, sit up. Thank you very much. I'll get in the middle. I'll 
guess I'll get in the middle. I'm a hush at this point. Ooh, epic. Epic. I am not going to talk much, but I um, had the great honor. I have a wonderful photograph of me at six months old. My mother was brilliant. She propped me up on some pillows and put in my lap a copy of The Learning Tree. And for Uncle Gordon's 90th birthday, I framed that picture up. And I sent it to him, and I said, Uncle Gordon, I was a baby prodigy. At six months, I began researching the documentary of your life. <laughs> and he called me and said, I know that's right, baby. I know that's right. And um, loved him. Love you, too. This is, right. this is something. And um, again, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for coming. I had um, the honor of um, being in Fort Scott. Um, last October, and Kyle, to meet you, and you received the Gordon Parks Award there, the Choice of Weapons Award, and um, so it was just such a joy. And uh, and I and again, I want my, my our choice. Our, our our scholars had a chance to watch the film. The way that the the film and the play resonates with young people is just amazing. So I'm sure my brother would say. You don't look any different than you did in the movie with, with your gray hair. You know, that's what the students say. But for, for you know, to, again, the experience, for both of you, like you talk about, but for you to talk about the film, I want to hear from the audience, because I'm not asking a lot of questions, because I'm still in awe of just being here. But the journey for you, I watched you as you watched the film. Um, here you are, you watch with such intensity. How old were you when you when you began this journey? Not only seeing yourself, but walking with Uncle Gordon, not just playing his the role in this autobiography of Gordon Parks, but walking with the man. Well, the journey began, um, actually my mother, um, some of you might know, uh, she's Nichelle Nichols, who uh, played Lieutenant Uhura on Star Trek. And as a, uh, uh, still in the early part of her career, um, you know, she had established herself and was, you know, had appeared in, uh, you know, various TV and, and film roles. Um, and she had come across the book, The Learning Tree, and uh, of course read it. And the, the uh, if you've read the book, uh, it's it's a fictionalized biography. You know, it's based on all the facts in his life, but it was written such that he could take uh, you know certain liberties as as a writer in order to condense uh, what took place over a longer span than what you see in the film. It was from when he was like 12 to 17, and obviously that would have made it difficult to make the film. So it was condensed so that it happened within a, a, a couple of years. And at the time, I, she didn't say anything at the time about it. Uh, but the first thing that came to her mind is, if he doesn't make this movie too quick, Kyle will be old enough to play the role. <laughs> so um, I guess I was about maybe uh, 13 or 14 when she uh, gave me the book. And she didn't say much about it. She just said, uh, oh, this is a, a great book. You ought to read this, which I did, and I agreed. Um, but I wasn't thinking in it uh, in the terms that she was at the time. So uh, it was a few years later, at least a couple of three years, I guess. Um, and I was in my last year of high school. And I got a call from my agent. I'd been working as an actor since I'd been seven or eight years old. And so uh, the agent called up and he said, well, um, there's a project that's going in, you know, that's being considered. And uh, the director is in town and he would like to meet with you. 
And I did not, as I recall, make the connection then about Gordon, the author, and Gordon, as it turned out, to be the director. So he was uh, at, a, um, at the Beverly Hills Hotel, had a, uh, a bungalow, which is uh, distinct even from having a suite. <laughs> and so uh, I was you know, informed that I could uh, meet him. The time was set. And up to that point, as a, as a young actor, uh, I, hadn't, I had never had occasion to actually meet with a director as part of an interview process. You know, typically it's in an office and there's, you know, when you get there, there's, you know, six or eight other people that are reading for the part and a casting agent and, you know, hustle and bustle and they give you a couple of sheets and you look at it and, you know, you got maybe 10 or 15 minutes to read it over and think of what you're going to do. And you go in and read and they, you know, the response is always, oh, that was wonderful. Oh, thank you very much for coming. And yes, we'll be in touch. And so my mother had told me about that experience, uh, you know, as a, many years before that. She said, look, when you go out on an interview, you pay attention, you listen closely to what they say, because they're going to, they may say something that's really going to give you an insight into what they're looking for or what the character is about, or, and there will be things that they will leave out on purpose, because they just want to get kind of your spontaneous reaction. So I kept that in mind, and she said, uh, the, the other thing, the con conclusion was that you go in, you do the best that you can, and then they're going to say that was great and we'll call you back, and then you walk out of there and you forget about it immediately. Do not give it another thought, because if they're interested, you will be the first one to know. And if not, you won't hear anything ever. <laughs> so I had never been in a situation where you, you know, you'd heard about it. But, oh, when I first met the, the great director, or well, when I saw her, I knew that she was the one, or whatever it was. Um, you know, I just uh, walked in and expected that, well, maybe he's going to ask, I guess he's going to ask me to read. And, um, you know, Mr. Parks and those of you, I know that there are some of you here that, that know him personally and is kind of understated, kind of soft-spoken manner. And he says, uh, yeah, yes, Kyle, yes, uh, yeah, I've heard good things about you and I'm glad you could, could uh, be here today and, you know, that we could talk a little bit. And so uh, we talked. He said, tell me a little bit about yourself. Well, I'm in high school. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. I've you know, played this role and that role. And he says, oh, yeah, that's good. Um, then he got to the really what mattered. And he said, uh, mm -hmm. um, can you swim? <laughs> I said, yeah, I can swim. I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not the world's best swimmer. I'm not going to the Olympics, but I can swim. And he said, oh, that's good. And then he said, uh, can you ride a horse? And I said, well, yeah, actually, I can. I often go horseback riding. I'd gone to summer camp. It was out in the desert. And you know, that's what we did is you know, a lot of uh, horse, you know, horse riding and you know, going on uh, trips through the desert on horseback. So um, he said, yeah, OK. And we talked a little bit further. And then he said, well, that that sounds fine, and uh, okay, well, uh, thank you very much, and we'll be in touch. <laughs> so I said, okay, and I walked out, and I forgot about it. But I didn't forget about it for too long, because next thing I know, I get a call, and this is another thing that had never happened before. I was being informed that they were going to do a screen test. So I, you know, showed up at Warner Brothers, and uh, you know, and went into wardrobe, they did makeup and so forth. And the, the screen test was, I think, the, was with uh, Estelle Evans, my, who played my mother, Gordon's mother. And 
we went through the screen test and same thing. Gordon said, that's, that's nice, Carl. Thank you very much. And, and uh, yeah, we'll talk to you soon. So the next week, I get another call for another screen test. And this one was, I don't know if it was the most important one, but I'm, but I'm not surprised it was toward the top of the list. This was a scene with my brother. It was the scene behind the barn when after, the, after Booker had killed uh, the farmer and uh, we're discussing it and, uh, and he says, well, it's a good thing that you don't know anything about it because now you don't have to say anything. It was that scene, which of course is on horseback. So <laughs> got that one out of the way. And I had another with, uh, with uh, Myra Waters, who played Arcella, and also one with Big Mabel. So, you know, I think that was pretty much covered it all, but I was going like, can this guy make up his mind or not? <laughs> I just, you know, I was just simply the last one to know that he had cast me at the very first meeting in the bungalow. And he wanted to kind of catch the vibe. He had seen things that I had already done. Uh, you know, he'd seen film of my previous performances and so forth. And I just, no one actually, you know, informed me that yes, you have the part and the screen tests were actually for the other characters, the other actors. <laughs> <laughs> and the hor and the horseback riding, of course. So uh, anyway, that's kind of how I, I came to know him. So I had a little bit more, even though I didn't realize it quite in real time, I had a little bit more insight to him as a person uh, as a result of that before I'd even seen the script. And, uh, you know, but the next call that came after that is uh, you're going to Fort Scott and you leave on September 3rd, you have 10 days or something like that. So that's kind of how I, I came to know Gordon uh, a little bit more as a person um, than simply someone else in the film industry that, you know, you, you meet lots of people in the film industry. But Gordon was uh, definitely a uh, unique individual and certainly precious to me for having gotten to know him. Yeah. The, the, the chemistry, um, very powerful, deep. I mean, you can look at, you know, photos from, the, you know, the photography from the making of the movie. Oh, yeah. And the chemistry between the two uh -huh. of you. Uh -huh. But see, this is another thing, too. The personal stories that I received from my uncle uh -huh. about you. Ah. That man loved you. <laughs> he really, he really, really, really loved you. You know, you, you mentioned a few things. I'm connecting again to uh -huh. the, to the um, being in Fort Scott with you in October. Uh -huh. I mean, it's, it's always really something. And, and, and Jamie can attest to this when we were there with the students. Uh -huh. um, it's just, just phenomenal. What was funny when the when the when the scholars went, they saw the movie before we went, and I'll tell you mm -hmm. what they were. Are we gonna get to meet Big Mabel? <laughs> <laughs> it does not matter what generation. A young man uh -huh. being able to see a scene where yeah. a young man gets to have a love scene with an older woman. I swear, where am I lying, Jamie? We get to meet Miss Mabel. Now, how old is Miss Mabel now? <laughs> They did not care because she was there, you know, yes, and yes. she still had that appeal. Yeah, and she loved those young boys up, and they uh, were sprung. <laughs> <laughs> they were sprung. It was just um, still a very magical uh, place. Even Stevie, when he was watching the movie, was that the lake uh, that we saw? Uh, but being there with mm -hmm. you was something. I just want to share this point uh, to bring Kevin in um, to watch the scene of great grandma passing and the casket in the house and, 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 and Uncle Gordon having that moment. Mm -hmm. And I had to, to look over at Kevin because we have that scene in the play. And how did you feel, Kevin, that same scene in the play? How, did you, how are you feeling, first of all, being with, with Kyle, but seeing 
I know you saw a little learning tree in prep for the play, but just how are you feeling? And that particular scene, which brought tears to my eyes, seeing it with the two of you, but that's when I cried um, in the play, seeing that particular scene. I was a little starstruck, <laughs> first and foremost, especially after just watching it and being like, oh my God, new, he's right here. <laughs> Um, but with that scene specifically, that's one of the most emotional scenes in the play. And it comes right at the beginning. And what was touching me as I was watching this, and of course I didn't realize this when I was watching it in prep, was even our blocking was pretty similar. Like how we had the casket set up and everything, and how you went to it is exactly how I moved to it. The only thing that we couldn't do, which I wanted to do, was lift the casket. You know, you actually lift it and look in, but... Pretty much everything else was the same, how I stayed the night with it and wept over it. So it brought me right back to the scene. It was kind of like making me sad again. <laughs> Even though it's you know, a character I play, you, those emotions you feel when you play it are very real. Your preparation for becoming Gordon Parks, you know, and not being able to walk with the man, but you kind of did, you know. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I took it seriously because I knew that there, you know, Gordon Parks was a real person and... I didn't have the opportunity to meet him and work with him like you did, which would have been amazing, but I had a lot of videos. There's a lot of videos. There's um, a recording of him reading A Choice of Weapons, of Gordon reading it, which is amazing for me as a person who's trying to play him to hear how he says his story, you know? Because it's one thing to read it, but to hear him tell it was huge. I watched the movies. I just tried to soak up everything I could. I wish I could have met him, though. That would have been amazing. I, I, I just I just feel it. We had um, oh we had we had such a good time yesterday um, with the screening of, of Half Past Autumn, the life and work of Gordon Parks, and being able to sit here and be in conversation with my brother Craig Rice, and even watching the doc again yesterday. Use your microphone. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, yesterday oh, I had I had great questions for Kevin, but he, he he answered them. But we had the screening of Half Past Autumn, um, the life and work of Gordon Parks yesterday, um, and our the director, Craig Rice, is here, and we had a great conversation. But watching the documentary again yesterday and even seeing, you know, images of Uncle Gordon Young, and, and I know he won't do it, but my brother, I'm watching it, and I'm like, man, my brother Kadar is here, and if you want to see Uncle Gordon Young, I mean, I know Kadar would not come up on the stage, but if he had that bushy mustache, you would be seeing my Uncle Gordon because Kadar straight up, you know, so he's not here, was, but he kind of is through Kadar, because we were in, we were in New York um, visiting the Kadar, we were, we were there, and, and I think he told Kadar, yeah, Billy, you know, you, you look like me, <laughs> so, but it is, I feel that sweet, sweet spirit and presence, you know, of him right now, I just really do feel Uncle Gordon's presence, um, but like I said, I've heard the story, I know, I've heard stories about it. a lot of folks I could go and walk with, you know, uh, in the films <laughs> and whatever. He loved you. One of the one of the um, things that's very important too, and I've talked about it after some of the talk, after some of the talkbacks after the play. I talked about it yesterday, especially relevant um, to today in the industry, which is very important if you want to talk about Gordon Parks' legacy. Um, as a filmmaker and his being the first ever, first ever Life magazine, Vogue magazine, first black director in Hollywood with The Learning Tree. Um, but he wasn't content with being the only first behind the camera as a director. Yeah, very much so. Uh, one of the other um, uh, effects that he had and an enduring one is the uh, number of black technicians and uh, those behind the camera, crew members, makeup artists, drivers, uh, set construction, you know, camera, all of that. Um, many of those, the way that works in Hollywood is you have to basically get so many days of work within a certain period in order to qualify to be a union member. And, you know, it wasn't atypical that people could work for years, 10 years, and never get enough work consistently that they still might pick up a job here and there, but they couldn't wind up getting a union card. Well, all of a sudden, uh, overnight, there were just a lot more black people in the various, uh, you know, support unions that make it possible to make motion pictures. You know, uh, when, when the film, 
uh, was announced and, you know, b before, even before I became aware of it, or b certainly before our meeting, um, there had been negotiations between Gordon and the studio and Fort Scott itself, which was, you know, initially not ready for prime time, but it just occurred at a period of time when the old guard was fading and younger, you know, newer people that were not as saddled with what they grew up with were coming into positions on, you know, within the economy, within the government, within, you know, civic organizations and so forth. And the old guard were still holding on to that um, disposition that they had had all of these years. Gordon had some serious conflicts and disagreements with, for instance, how his parents' graves were maintained. Mm -hmm. And all others in the cemetery were typically, you know, the black cemetery, the white cemetery, etc. That was an issue to him, and it was long before he had any issue with, uh, you know, the, the matter of the film was even part of the picture. You know, this is going back to when he first, you know, uh, became known as an artist through Life magazine, etc. And so that had been, you know, a sore spot for many years prior to the film. And when he started becoming better known for his work in Life magazine, interviewing, you know, Muhammad Ali, uh, photographing, you know, the civil rights movement, all of those classic black and white photos from the, 60, the 60s that really tell the story of America. And they were apprehensive that he, oh, well, he's, he's now a, become a militant. Mm. And, you know, they had those concerns that it would somehow, he would cause trouble. And, but when this new wave of young people, mo again, mostly white from, in Fort Scott, came along, their reaction was, Wait a minute. Let me get this straight. Warner Brothers is talking about coming here with a crew of over 100 people mm -hmm. and book up every hotel room in town, and they're going to be here for three months, and they're going to be buying stuff from the hardware store and this, that, and the other, and hiring people to perform, perform other services. Mm -hmm. And you don't want that to happen? Right. Wow. It was just a kind of a moment like that that caused things to change, just like that. And it also, uh, when we were preparing to, uh, you know, to go to Fort Scott, you know, particularly, you know, I, mean, I think everybody on the crew had an awareness of the importance of the film uh, an historical importance, and the importance of it being well done and it succeeding. And as black people, of course, you know, we're, you know that we're going to be kind of under a microscope, so everybody's, you know, kind of on their best behavior and, you know, with an awareness of what some mischance, how that could impact the entire project. But the thing was that by the time we got there, that change that I'm speaking of had already started to go into effect. And by the time we left, the people, both black and white, in Fort Scott, you know, were now genuinely sorry to see us leave because so many of them we came to know. You know, we're eating in the same restaurants, we're walking up and down the same streets, we're you know, and sharing in the experience of the movie, because lots of the local people 
were included in the cast. The woman who was the bearded lady at the carnival, <laughs> she was the wife of one of the richest people in town. <laughs> and she had the time of her life. It was just <laughs> so, you know, it had that kind of personal effect as well. And even after we left, the people that we had uh, struck up relationships with and, you know, telephone calls or letters that letters, those things you used to write. <laughs> um, we, those exchanges continued and the black people in the town said, this is truly remarkable. We feel like we've advanced, you know, a hundred years almost overnight. There was no way they could not, once people had seen and felt, experienced, engaged in relationships that were respectful and acknowledged everybody's worth. Wow. There was no way to go back. Wow. There was no way to go back. Wow. And, you know, the civil rights matters, you know, writ large continue, obviously, to this day. But in that place and at that time, something changed and it did not change back. So that was something that we were all felt that we were privileged to be a part of, that we played a role in making that change. It's amazing. So, yeah. oh, see, and DEI training can't do that. I mean, and, and it's about relationship building. We, we talked a little bit about that yesterday um, when Craig talked about um, the team that made the first HBO documentary on uh -huh. Uncle Gordon's life, mm -hmm. um, the, what the crew looked like. Yeah. Again, yeah. if you're going to do something about Gordon Parks mm -hmm. in the spirit of Gordon Parks, then you have to do yeah. it in the way he would have like done Gordon it. Like Gordon Parks. Like Gordon Parks. Yes. It was the same way with the play. Mm -hmm. Um, I talked about it when, you know, being able to walk with the black playwright, Harrison Rivers and the first di black director I ever worked with was who? Talvin Wilkes. Yes. Amazing. I mean, music director, yes. Darnell, Darnell Davis, yes. set designer, say two Jones. Say two. Yeah. Amazing cast. Yeah. And I, but I, and I love my brother, a lot of you, Ryan Palooza of history theater, you know, but when you know you do that and I talked often about that's what it looks, this is what it looks like when Black Lives Matter, you know? And I love, again, my brothers and sisters of a lighter hue who support what it really looks like when Black Lives Matter. That means black folks taking their rightful place in telling their narratives. That's authenticity, right? That's what you get. You can't, DEI training can't do that. We talk about the credits. Yesterday we talk about, I tell all of my students, Media making students, watch the credits after the movie because you're looking at the names of the people who work sometimes more mm -hmm. than the people in front of the camera. Mm -hmm. I said yesterday, I'm coining this, it's not about the emotions, it's about the economics. Those are people that are then being able to support their families and support their communities. And I know, and then too, you're getting paid, then you can then do the next project and the next project. You have the resources to continue to write the plays and the books and the, mm -hmm. make the movies, that's it. And then you have something as powerful as this. And whenever I see the learning tree and some of other, next week it's Lead Belly. Mm -hmm. He had to fight to do Lead Belly with the integrity, of the, to, to the integrity to tell that man's story. That's another powerful, powerful story. And I knew, and then Solomon Northup's Odyssey, the first 12 years a slave. Movie. That was done by a man who was a descendant of slaves. That was done by Uncle Gordon. You know, and so, but to see the learning tree again where he didn't have, it was unapologetic of telling a true story about the black experience. Y'all, you gotta, I don't mind, I love walking in partnership. But let us, let us do us. So that then my scholar can tell his story. I expect a story from you, my brother. I expect that of you all. You're already lifting up your vision. So be, in spite of all they have to deal with and see on the news about themselves, we walk with them, huh, Jamie? And at first day of class, they're all quiet. 
But by the end of that third week, they're standing up and lifting up visions of peace, possibilities, power, and purpose. Because they're walking in Uncle Gordon's footsteps. Should we open it up for... Let me say this last fun thing. This is my brother. He, he, he gave the surprise out. Tomorrow, these two brothers will be at Gordon Parks High School for a tree learning tree planting ceremony. There will be a learning tree planted at Gordon Parks High School! Can I ask if our scholar can, you have a, your first question can go to you. He brought his mama and his brother <laughs> for Mother's Day. Um, my question is for, um, no, that's what I call you, sir. <laughs> how, uh, how long did it like take you to mentally prepare the fact that you were gonna be walking and doing a movie with Gordon Parks himself about his own self? Like, how did that feel? Um, well, there, you know, there's, there's, um, just the kind of the, the basics of it, of reading the script, you know, uh, several times because you're not going to absorb everything the first time. So you're going to read the script, you're going to think about it, you're going to start memorizing your lines, you're going to see something else about one of the other characters, not about your character, but one something about the other character that, why is he saying this to this person? So you're gonna, you're, you're gonna have to think about that other character and why, why this scene is happening and what, how does it advance the story? And then you're going to go back and read the script again, and you're going to see something that completely escaped you the first time. And you're going to go th just through several rounds of that. And then when you get there and you, uh, you know, kind of the cast gathers and there are questions back and forth, and that's another kind of round of consideration that helps in the process. And then you're going to get a call, and you're going to go out on the set, and you're going to shoot whatever scene is the first scene. In our case, it was uh, the storm scene was one of the first things. I think before that, we did some of the stuff, the titles, when the, front, the, the lead titles, when I'm walking through the field and turning somersaults and <laughs> kind of being a 15-year-old you know, kid. I was pretty buff then too. I was, I was, I was, I was going. Is that? You know what what? I, ne I never noticed that before, really. That I, I was, you know, I was kind of, kind of thin but wiry. And so, you know, it's just a voyage of discovery, and you kind of uh, enter into it with your eyes open and your mind open and your emotions available, and. Then once it gets quiet on the set and they say action, something else happens and that's what winds up on film. So it's, it's, a, it's a process. It's, it's not, it wasn't something that I did so deliberately in terms of preparing as much kind of just going through the, you know, the essentials and the mechanics of it and when you have control of the mechanics, then it kind of frees, frees you up to actually engage without thinking about the mechanics. So that's, that's how it kind of works for me, yeah. Thank you. I look forward to asking you a lot more questions tomorrow because I'm going right. to be with you tomorrow. <laughs> All right. Please. We we're opening up questions audience, please. We're here. What does ASJ mean? On the credits, the producer, ASJ. ASJ. Yeah. ASJ. Um, was that who? It was that, and that was in the end credits. You know, you're on credits on TV. Always hear ASJ. ASJ. Oh, oh, I. Oh, it's the union. Is he talking about the yeah. union? Yeah, I, 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 it may be. I was just thinking American Society of. Oh, 
whatever. I, I, don't, I don't know that that's exactly what you're referring to, but that's what came to mind. And Mr. Cunningham, I want to thank you for always showing up for everything I do. My brother from Rondo community. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Always, always, always showing up. Rondo, I want you to know too, um, great, you know, uh, great grandparents really poured into Uncle Gordon, but also the Rondo community. The Rondo, he's from Rondo. You know, you need to know that. You know, St. Paul, Rondo community. So this is my brother from Rondo. But, oh, uh, there we go. 67, right on. Yeah. Brother Cunningham. And Questions? And, yes. I'm yeah, and also, if you, if you have uh, any observations about the film, uh, I, I know that today, as I was watching it, uh, again, you, you feel your response to it is, I, you know, I, I see it from time to time. You know, it's not something like I go back and look at it once a week. <laughs> but... There are, there are things in the film that uh, kind of struck me today just because of events in the world that are current. And if there are things that you might, you know, have made observations about something in the film that resonated with some of these things that we're all experiencing now, feel free to comment. I'd be interested in hearing what you have to say. Well, I had a question before that. Um, mm -hmm. in, in the shooting of it, the, each scene, the point is made so clearly. I mean, the scenes just yes. continue on, but really a tight, clean. Yeah. And was that the way it was shot, or did a lot of it get edited, or how did how did it no, work? No, it, it was pretty that much in the. Um, it was pretty much in the script, but it was also, um, you know, again, the people you work with uh, animate what's on the page. And once you start engaging with them and that relationship, like I was saying, when you're trying to figure out, you know, why am I saying to this, to this person or, or what is that, what's that supposed to produce in terms of what you see on the screen? So uh, the, the people, the, the relationship that you develop with the cast and with the director and even with the lighting and the cameraman, because, you know, again, when you understand the mechanics it frees you up to do your real work. Yeah. So, yeah, it was very, very tightly written. But, you know, Gordon, that was, he knew it was going to be right because he was there. <laughs> you talked about observation. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I was here yesterday for the documentary, uh -huh. and I noticed his pipe, uh -huh. and I... <laughs> It didn't uh, resonate with me at the time, but when I, I watched the movie last night and then I saw it again today, uh -huh. uh, and I encourage everybody to watch it more than once, and uh -huh. over, and, over and over. Anyway, that pipe, uh -huh. that dad, Yes. it, it was the same design. Uh -huh. The same, uh, yeah, it had that little curve to it. Uh -huh. That it, Gordon. It, it, my, it, it, I'm sure Gordon gave it to him. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, Gordon, Gordon was uh, not only a, you know, uh, obviously a photographer, writer, now director, but uh, Gordon cut my hair. <laughs> you know, you're doing these things out of sequence, right? So you can't have, you know, too long here and too short there. And he was the person who actually cut my hair to make sure that that was consistent. You know, that that element was consistent when you're doing things that are out of sequence. Or, oh, no, we have to go back and add these scenes. You know, this is, you know, two different locations. It was one day, it was in the script, it was at this location, and the, the follow-up next day is another, so you, that has to match. So uh, he did that and, of course, wrote the music. I mean, he is indeed, it's not an overstatement to call him a Renaissance man. He is, a Renaissance man. He is you know, he was made, either the term was made <laughs> for him or he was made to meet that term, and he certainly was. See, yeah. I learned something new. I didn't know he was a barber, too. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> People don't know he was a chef. As I shared yesterday, he, he, you could not take him out to dinner ever. He always cooked. He, 
he he swore he was a chef too. I mean, it's just, and I know a barber. I did not know that. Could I already think he did his own hair? That 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 process. I, mean, <laughs> I don't know. I, I I'll be I'd be curious to know if while you were doing the movie, was Gordon clear that you were playing him, or was he never like, uh, you know, like upfront about that? Because in the book, it's not necessarily, you know, clearly him and the learning tree. Uh, no, it, it was, yeah, no, it was explicit, of course. It was, it was, yeah. okay, okay. Yeah. Even with the haircuts, I guess, while he was yeah, telling right. you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Cool. Yeah, Kyle, um, I know you talked about, you know, when you're doing the, uh-huh. doing the movie and uh-huh. you had to do stuff, you know, over again and things, but once it's done... It's done, but then I always wonder about when you're doing the play and you have to, you know, I wonder if people are doing it over again. You gotta do it the next night, do it over again and over again. Does it get, I don't know, what is it, redundant? Does it get Dry, to Dry, redundant? Yeah, whatever. <laughs> no, I mean, part of doing theater is, is keeping it fresh, you know, every night, but especially with this story, and walking with Robin and hearing her stories about her uncle, I felt like I was actually learning more about Gordon, which informed my performance. So it never really got stale for me because I was like, I know more now so I can make this choice. And I know more. So yeah, it never really got stale. Thank you. Misha. (laughs) (laughs) This second, here it comes. I want to give a shout out to my junior high school buddy Robin up here in the audience there. You a friend from junior high? Okay. My my father, he was a mentor to my father, a photographer. Oh. And he went to his New Year's apartment and the pictures. I, I was gonna give it to you. Oh, good. I, that's all I need to say. <laughs> uh, you were talking about details, and I noticed the photographer in him placed the presidential portraits in the. In the principal's office, it was Thomas Jefferson with his freighted history. And then in the courthouse, it was Abraham Lincoln. And I'm just wondering what, you know, what your take on that is. And, I, and I, I'm not sure if it was intentional, but next to the uh, Jefferson portrait in the principal's office, I swore I saw a noose and a, 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 curtain, a curtain string. So I don't know. I'm, I'm sure that was not intentional, but uh, just the placement of the portraits. Um, I don't remember that I've given it any thought, mm-hmm. but what, what I was, when I was inviting comment, uh, I was thinking particularly of the, of the courtroom scene with you know what we've seen on television in the past right. few years, uh, the George Floyd. Yeah. Um, the uh, the jogger that was yes. was was killed, yeah, um, and you know just the, the, the there was a certain resonance in what the judge said at the end that uh, I've seen the movie you know over the decades you know a few dozen times and that. Just seeing it now and hearing him say that and knowing what's going on with the Supreme Court, you know, and, you know, do these guys even get it? You know, it, you, you can't, oh, well, I certainly can't help, but think about that. The simplest words, which we've heard before, not just in this film, but, you know, uh, any number of people would speak about the justice system from time to time, and I'm sure that we all have, you know, our references that on that topic. But it can't be said apparently often enough, because the very people that sit on the Supreme Court don't seem to get it. I'm I'm gonna stray from our subject just a little bit. Not only do I think that the Trump appointees 
lied in those Senate hearings. I think that they should not be criticized. I think they should be impeached. I think they should be removed from office. And our democracy is in grave danger if this is allowed to pass. And I would say one thing even further than that. They're not only dishonorable, they are not only liars, but they are so morally bankrupt that they should be condemned for having accepted the nominations from Donald Trump and never having said a word about the process that they imposed on Merrick Garland. I, 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 I've given this a lot of thought, and I feel that we, if, if, if we cannot think of it in those terms, whether it actually comes about is, 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 is one thing or another. But if we cannot confront that, if we have some, someone where the process is so corrupt that he's these people have bought those seats on the bench, they bought them. If we can't acknowledge and condemn that, our moral and democratic small d souls are at risk. And that's what I was seeing in that courtroom scene when the judge admonished wow. that crowd wow. under that circumstance. It was in a movie. Wow. It was part of a script. Wow. It was succinct. Yes. But it said everything that needed to be said to understand what occurred in the scene and what occurred in the minds and the hearts of the people in that courtroom. And if we cannot understand our lives, our country, our citizenry in plain and succinct terms, if, if on the other hand, everything is kind of a mechanism to obscure clarity, we, that, that is really a red flag. And I think that we all need to give that some thought. And that was the, when I was referring to earlier about things that you see in the film. That's what it was for me on this occasion seeing the film. I didn't think that when I was in Fort Scott six months ago and saw it. But I certainly, I was drawn right to it, just given... And again, that Earth scene was filmed in what year? 68. 68. Yeah. Oh, that 68, it was filmed in 68. Profound mm -hmm. and bold. Mm -hmm. And bold mm -hmm. and made it plain. Mm -hmm. And then you talked about what this whole movement did for a town. Mm-hmm. Uncle Gordon didn't even want to go back until that town desegregated the cemetery. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about what this movie movement, I call mm -hmm. it, did for a town. Mm -hmm. And here we are. Mm -hmm. For such a time as this, I asked Kyle last night when we went to get some food, is it time for a resurgence mm -hmm. of the learning tree? I'm about to do some stuff here. We have my dear brother, Antonio Richardson, who is my partner on so many things. We were in Fort Scott. He came to Fort Scott. Producer, photographer, director, visionary, extraordinary. He's the photographer who works with Jamie and I in the legacy class, the photographer of the, the scholars. He was a photographer. Uh, who uh, the director of the play, Telvin, 
asked, he said, Robin, do you think we can get some photographs for the play um, of Gordon's photographs? I said, ah, it's gonna, we'll never get to the play done if we try to get permission from the foundation. And he thought, well, what if we recreated some of the imagery? I said, he said, you know, a photographer, uh, Antonio Richardson. <laughs> and if you saw the play, oh my God, what he did. Phenomenal. So you got what, scenes where you're click? Yeah, there's a scene, well, there's multiple scenes where Gordon gets his camera and is taking photos, and Antonio was able to capture exactly what I was getting on stage. Right. I don't even know when he did it, because he wasn't on stage with me. Right. But he had the poses and everything down. And, and other people even thought that he had an eye similar to Gordon. I noticed a lot of people yes, in the sir. audience would say they thought Gordon had taken those pictures. Brilliant, 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 brilliant. So we're, we're doing some things, but he came, and we, for years, Jamie and I, we had, a, we had a, you know, one of our... Her, her colleagues that would come in and take the, the essay portraits of the scholars. And cool, very, very powerful. But Antonio took it to a whole nother level. What we do with this movement of in the footsteps of Gordon Parks and Gordon Parks' legacy work here, whole nother level. You know, Uncle Gordon's dear friend James Baldwin said, it's time for lovers of humanity to find one another. That's what we're doing. That's what this partnership is about, Amy. Um, lovers of humanity finding one another. I'm so excited to announce many years ago, I had this vision of Uncle Gordon standing again in downtown St. Paul with a statue or a memorial. We're starting that up again. He will stand in Landmark Plaza. We're starting that. That's going to happen. My dear sister, Debbie Montgomery, when she was city council member, she said, if, if, Snoopy, if Snoopy can be on parade, we can sure have a statue of Gordon Parks. We will have that. I plan to have a mighty vision council of, of visionaries who walked with Gordon Parks. So you better be ready to come on back. We're going to figure out. We, we ain't going to have you drive. We're going to figure out. I know it was a long plane trip, but I am calling upon that vision council to ensure that we do have a resurgence of learning tree and again, a mighty, mighty movement in the footsteps of Gordon Parks. Thank you all. Thank you all for being with us. We have one more question coming. Okay. I mean, hey, hey, we're at your house, Amy, so you kick us out. She may say to us, you ain't gotta go home, but you gotta get out of here. So as long as she just, okay. We have time for one more, she said. Oh, uh, for Kyle. Yes. Um, Who are you? I'm Aaron. Um, That's my brother, Aaron. I'm, I'm the great nephew of Gordon Parks. Yeah. All the way from California. Rob, my, yeah, my sister Robin. She's, she's doing great things. Um, what, how many times have you seen the movie? <laughs> and um, what, what, does it hold your attention every time you watch it later and later? Yeah, it certainly does. Um, and I don't watch it that often. I mean, it's usually at an event like this, or perhaps uh, you know, a friend of mine wants to see it. You know, so we sit down and watch it. But you know, it's it's infrequent. And I, um, you know, I'm I'm the kind of guy that doesn't have a DVD collection. You know. I got lots of records, but I, 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 don't, I don't collect films like, oh, I got that one, you know, checklist. Um, but, I, but they are important to me, and I, I retain them. I was just, um, this past week uh, with my wife, uh, there's a little film society that uh, exists in our community. And uh, it's at the armory out in Santa Clara, kind of an adjacent community. And, you know, it's, they don't even, they don't, it's not a theater. It's just, you know, it's like uh, AV in high school. They pull the screen up and got a little DVD projector thing. Uh, but the film we watched, and I had never seen it before. I don't know how I had gotten this far in life without seeing Judgment at Nuremberg. And uh, again, you know, just the, the resonance, resonance of that in our time. You know, this is a film that was done in 1960, mm -hmm. and it's in black and white. And it's an absolutely remarkable cast. It's one of the 
the, I, I feel one of the greatest ensemble performances I've ever seen in a Hollywood movie, mm. particularly from, the to, from that time because, you know, the 50s, the 60s was kind of a time of a spectacle and, you know, kind of the, you know, the, the entertainment value, the box office, the et cetera, et cetera. This was just a masterful film. And I was seeing it for the first time, and I'm going like, this could have been released yesterday. Mm. You know, I mean, it, it's, it's remarkable to me how films can have that effect. You know, and I've seen it this once. I'm not going to forget it. <laughs> and I, I think that most of the films that I've seen that I feel have an impact, I might have only seen them one time, but I can remember it right now. So, um, yeah, so I, I, I see it from time to time, but, you know, years could go by in between. Yeah. It's wonderful. Well, again, I'd like to thank you all. I'd love to thank our guests. Devin's here. Hey, thank you for everything. <laughs> Alicia, who was with uh, the Landmark, who can't be with us. She's just been an angel. And um, Amy, again, thank you. Thank you all. My brothers, oh my goodness. Thank you so much. Oh. And join us next week. We have Lead Belly, Lead Belly. And we'll be honoring um, Kakai Ampa, who's St. Paul's own, and Art Evans, who's Blind Lemon and Lead Belly. Thank you. Tell folks, come on. <laughs>